ITP stands for idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. The pathology here is that it's an immune-mediated platelet destruction. On labs, you see an increased bleeding time. Now, whenever you see an increased bleeding time, it's because platelets are being destroyed. The patient presents with bleeding from mucosal sites, like their gums. So when they brush their teeth, maybe they bleed more. Cells that you'll see on a smear, there are none. So this is often following a recent infection. And the way that I like to remember this in my mnemonic for coming up with ITP is that you just focus on the word idiopathic. This is really idiopathic and it's a diagnosis of exclusion. You go for ITP as the answer when there is no pathognomonic findings suggesting any other bleeding disorder. I started with this one because it's the most simple and the most idiopathic. As you'll see, the other bleeding disorders all have pathognomonic findings. But ITP is kind of like, well, I don't know, they're bleeding, it's ITP, what else could it be? That's really what ITP is. You'll see how simple this is compared to the other ones as we continue to move through. The next disease is TTP, or thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. The pathology here is that there's a deficiency in something called Adam TS13, which means that you have more von Willebrand factor. We'll come back to this in a second. On labs, you see an increased bleeding time because platelets are being destroyed. Obviously, there's a thrombocytopenia which causes an increased bleeding time. The presentation here is very specific. You have the thrombocytopenia as platelets are destroyed. They lead to lysis of red blood cells, which causes an anemia. You get a fever as a systemic response. You get neurologic symptoms, and you get renal dysfunction. These are five very unique, very classic symptoms of TTP. The cells that you see on the smear are schistocytes, and let's talk about how this works. So here you have a blood vessel, and normally in the blood vessel you have von Willebrand factor. Von Willebrand factor is usually inhibited by Adam TS13, which keeps the von Willebrand factor in check, keeping the blood vessel open. However, if you have a deficiency in Adam TS13, the von Willebrand factor does not go away. It builds up and causes platelet aggregation to the area. Because of this, usually Red blood cells move through blood vessels unimpeded, but if you have a platelet aggregating on von Willebrand factor, as the red blood cell tries to move through the blood vessel, it gets sliced in half, and this creates the classical finding on smear called a schistocyte. Here you can see what a schistocyte looks like. The red blood cell was trying to pass through the vasculature, but platelet aggregation caused it to be sliced in half and created these schistocytes. So the mnemonic for TTP is the terrible pentat. Again, there are five very classical symptoms associated with TTP, and you have to know them all, and they're right here. Fever, neurologic symptoms, renal problems, anemia, and platelets. TTP is the terrible pentat. The next one that we're going to talk about is HUS, or hemolytic uremic syndrome. This is a toxic-mediated hemolysis. On labs, you have destruction of platelets causing thrombocytopenia and an increased bleeding time. You also get an increased creatinine, and this is very important. The presentation of HUS is that somebody is infected with a certain strain of E. coli called H157H7, or O157H7. This is a very specific strain of E. coli that is often causing a bloody diarrhea which is followed by kidney failure. This toxin is what is contributing to the disease. So the platelets, basically this is exactly what's happening with TTP, but in the kidney. So what happens is that the platelets aggregate. Red blood cells try to pass through and they get sheared in half, creating schistocytes. But because this is all happening in the kidney, you're getting your classic thrombocytopenia, you're getting your classic anemia, you're getting your schistocytes, but it's specifically happening in the kidney, which causes an acute uremic syndrome. You have an increased creatinine and you have signs of kidney failure. So this usually happens in children who ingest this toxin. On your exam, it'll probably be a child who had some type of bloody diarrhea. On lab, they have elevated creatinine and they're going to be like, what is it? Or what is the toxin? And you have to know a few things. One, that it's HUS. Two, the specific strand of E. coli, O157H7. Memorize that name, o 157 H7. The way that I remember HUS is that I just say hemolysis, uremia, stomach virus. Literally, they get a bloody diarrhea with stomach virus-like symptoms. Then they get the signs of thrombocytopenia, hemolysis, and uremia. This is very high yield because it connects microbiology with E. coli. It connects physiology with 
platelet consumption and anemia occurring in the kidney. This shows up on every single step one exam and you have to know HUS. The last one that we're going to talk about is DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation. This is an inappropriate widespread clotting activation. This is very complex, but it's easy to understand if you break it down. DIC is basically what can happen secondary to trauma, secondary to sepsis, secondary to obstetric complications. What happens here is that there's an inappropriate activation of the clotting cascade. So you consume all of your clotting factors. You have microthrombi forming throughout the body. You're occluding various parts of the body. But because you're using up all of the clotting factors, the PTPTT actually goes up because you have no clotting factors left. Your bleeding time also goes up because platelets go down. So you're clotting everywhere, but you're bleeding. So this usually presents with like bleeding from veiny puncture sites. And it could happen like after the patient's in a car accident or if they've been septic following an infection. The D-dimer is elevated. This is the only bleeding disorder that we've talked about today where the D-dimer goes up. So that makes it very unique. Now because we're forming microthrombi throughout the body, fibrinogen goes down because you're consuming the fibrinogen to make those clots. Again, the presentation here is going to be bleeding, sepsis, trauma, clotting. You will see schistiocytes because as you consume platelets and form these microthrombi throughout the body, you are still shearing those red blood cells. So the mnemonic for DIC is damn, I'm clotting. Damn, I'm clotting. So I want to give you the summary slide here. This is showing TTP versus ITP versus DIC, and hemolytic uremic syndrome is not pictured on this slide, but it could be very easy to fill this in if you have a basic understanding of the disease. Again, as far as mnemonics are concerned, we'll start with ITP. The I stands for idiopathic. So literally, if you don't see schistiocytes, if you don't see an elevated D-dimer, if you don't have kidney failure, you'll be like, oh, I don't know, it's idiopathic, it's ITP. If it's TTP, it's the terrible pentad. You have to look for your fever, your neurologic symptoms, your kidney failure, your thrombocytopenia, and your anemia with schistiocytes. They are five symptoms. It is the terrible pentad. For DIC, it's damn, I'm clotting. You're going to look for a decreased fibrinogen because you're forming clots everywhere. You're going to look for an increased D-dimer, very specific to DIC. You're going to look for it following trauma or infection. Guys, again, this is high yield. Know the differences. It will help you on your exam. Because if you just look at the lab results that they give you, you're going to be able to sort this out. But it requires a basic understanding of the differences between these bleeding disorders. Good luck.